On today's show, is Luke Misa the fastest prospect in a 2024 NHL draft? We answer that and a lot more on today's episode of Locked On NHL Prospects. You are Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On this podcast, we break down everything prospects related for you five days a week, Monday to Friday. I'm Hattie Kalakesh, joined by Sebastian High, and on today's show, we'll be breaking down Luke Misa's game in detail. He's a center uh, out of the Mississauga Steelheads. He's available for the 2024 NHL Draft, and he might just be one of the paciest prospects in the draft. We'll talk about his puck skills, his skating in the first segment. We'll talk about the toolkit, habits, decision-making, more of the intricate stuff in the second segment and in our third we'll talk about the projection with Luke Misa what he projects at at the NHL level what his upside is and which team would be the best fit for him before we get into any of that today's episode is brought to you by Sleeper download the Sleeper app and use promo code locked on NHL for up to get up to a hundred dollar match on your first deposit terms and, terms and conditions apply see Sleeper's terms of use for details if you're watching on YouTube make sure to like and subscribe leave us a comment letting us know what you want us to talk about next and if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform make sure to make us your first listen of the day. I also want to thank all of our all of our listeners to, for hitting a thousand subscribers on YouTube. A great milestone for us, uh, and we'll be ramping up the content as we approach the 2024 NHL draft. So stay tuned. Uh, we got some great stuff going on. We're also both going to the draft. Um, I'm the director of North American Scouting for Dauber Prospects. Uh, Sebastian is the head scout and uh, head of European scouting for Dauber Prospects as well. Um, and we've both got uh, media availabilities. We'll be at the draft, kind of reacting to stuff. We'll have some, uh, some, you know, some live content for you as well, some stuff like that leading into it and on draft day. So stay tuned for all of that. But to get to the main focus, Luke Misa. Talk me through the profile with Luke Misa, size, handedness, what kind of style he plays. Uh, let's get right into it. For sure. So Luke Misa, as you mentioned, is very pacey. The skating definitely pops out. This is a five foot ten, 165 pound left shot centerman. Uh, and he's one of the older players uh, in the OHL. That's a, that's a draft eligible, first time draft eligible. He's a November 25th, 05 birthday. Uh, but with that, uh, I guess, maturity in terms of age for being a draft eligible, he's really been able to dominate on a not so dominant Mississauga Steelheads uh, team this season. He's been quite consistently the best player on the ice for them, and he's logged 26 goals and 81 points through 66 OHL games, which is good for fourth among draft eligibles out of the OHL, just behind Zane Parekh, Liam Greentree, and Merrick Vanacker. So he is a pacey, skilled uh, center at the OHL level, who probably projects best as a winger uh, at the professional ranks. But in terms of the puck skill, so we're talking about the shooting, the playmaking, the passing, and the handling skill, which of those things pops out the most in your viewings of him? Definitely, definitely the playmaking ability. I really like the vision in his playmaking game, the way that he connects plays, and especially the fact that he's able to make really crisp, really accurate, and really smart passes at his top speed. We often see that with prospects that are faster than everyone else. Um is that their mental game lags behind. They have the foot speed, but once they get to that top speed, does their level of play stay the same? Does it improve? Does it kind of decrease in quality? And off the time with faster players, the quality of their plays decreases as they get faster on the ice. Uh, but it's the opposite for Luke Misa. Oftentimes his game scales up really well when he's skating at his fastest speed. Um, and that really, really, I mean, that resonates really well for me regarding the playmaking ability. The passes are accurate. He's got a variety of passes that, that he can use. He can hook passes under sticks. Uh, he can delay with the puck uh, and make a pass inside of a toe drag. Uh, oftentimes he's hitting seams really well as well. Uh, he's passing under sticks really often cross crease, that kind of stuff. So all the little details I like playmaking wise, um, uh, are there. They're just, I wouldn't say there's any kind of flash to it. Um, there's variety, there's efficiency, but there's not a lot of flash. So I would say it's a, it's a six and a half tool for me, the playmaking ability. Um, the shot, meanwhile, is about average. I don't really see it as anything that's going to stand out to you. Um, I think he could score some goals at the NHL level, but he's definitely going to be more of a playmaker. Uh, I see kind of 15, maybe 20 goal upside, uh, if everything works out well. Uh, so yeah, I'd give his, his shooting a five, maybe even a four and a half. It's not really strong. It's not a really powerful shot either. 
Um, and yeah, I, I think that that overall is kind of the split regarding Misa, and that's what you can expect from him at the NHL level. Like I said, I, I don't think he's really going to be a sharp shooter. You don't put him really on the half wall as a as a as a scoring option. He doesn't really have the best one timer. Uh, but the playmaking ability is fantastic. He's going to be able to make those passes from the half wall to the inside, to the bumper, to the to the low slot, uh, and just connect plays extremely well, but not just on the power play, five on five as well. Um, but what do you think of, ha- of his handling ability? I've, I've liked it, especially his ability to keep the, the puck very controlled at his top speeds. Uh, that's probably one of the bigger strengths in his game is that all of his tools seem to actually like ramp up a notch when he's going at his top speed, as you mentioned earlier, right? And that's yeah. definitely significantly due to how he processes the game very quickly. Like he reacts very well and he always has a couple options open for himself uh, rather than necessarily doubling down on a single one. But the handling definitely like it flows very nicely with the rest of, the, of his toolkit. But similarly to the playmaking game, there's perhaps a bit of a lack of flash. Like there's, mm-hmm. there's, a, an element of dynamism in Luke Misa's game on puck, but it's not the type of dynamism that is necessarily going to break open the offensive zone on every single shift. He doesn't necessarily use his his puck handling in order to create space for himself. He really accesses space and creates space using his feet primarily, but he's able to navigate that space quite well with his hands. For sure. I think the main thing that stands out to me is, is his ability to wriggle through defensive lines, especially when it comes to carrying the puck in on the power play. Um, I think he's the best in the OHL right now at being able to wriggle through a defensive line and find space behind coverage uh, when he's breaking into the offensive zone. You know, we see a lot of teams, especially with the with the double drop and the single drop passes on the power play, a lot of teams will hold the blue line, right, uh, on the penalty kill. They'll kind of sit in the line, you know, either, either as a 1-3 or a one two one that kind of situation but they're mostly just holding that blue line and making sure that they're forcing a dump in and you just can't force a dumping against luke misa that's what makes him so interesting i'd say the combination of skating and and handling is really what works out i don't think the handling in isolation is good it's kind of the opposite of ivan demidov right like ivan demidov his, his edge work and skating isn't ideal but the hands are ridiculous um there's a disconnect there whereas with misa it's just the package of the two works so well together um, even though the handling itself isn't necessarily kind of a, a blow you away type of tool, right? Yeah, precisely. Like like with, with Misa, I think one of the elements that makes him so effective in his high pace play is that he's able to blend all of these like plus level tools into one very cohesive toolkit uh, on its own already. Like I think his on puck game is already quite refined uh, in terms of when he's given space, he will attack it doggedly, but he's not the type of player that that is going to double down on that when it's not a, a rational option. Like he uses his line mates very yeah. well. As you mentioned, he's a very capable and accurate passer. When a passing lane is wide open to him, he's going to choose that option rather than holding onto the puck for too long. And it's also one of the reasons that his like transition metrics are just like off the charts good. If you're looking yeah. at the data that Mitch Brown has tracked so far this season, same gut kind of goes with the playmaking metrics as well. Like he gets a ton of pucks towards the slot and uh, like he's able to generate primary assists at basically a higher rate than any other OHL or barring St. Perec this season. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll end off with the skating for this first segment. I think the skating is amazing. It's an eight, oh, yeah. eight and a half for me. It's a, least, it's a yeah. high end tool in this game at the very minimum. I think that, you know, in terms of the the power that he puts behind his strides, it's not all there. But outside of that, I mean, the mechanics are fantastic. The footwork is great. The the speed at which he goes through his his stride cycle is amazing. You know, he just he goes from stride to recovery so quickly. He uses crossovers so often to kind of create that dynamism in his game and that lateral um, unpredictability, I guess you would say. Uh, where, you know, by using his crossovers, he's making it really hard to predict which side of the defenseman he's going to take. Um, yeah. And that's what makes him such an effective puck carrier. I think the skating is really what kind of uplifts the whole game. And like like we mentioned before, uh, th- the fact that he's able to make these plays at high speeds and not necessarily, um, you know, the fact that he's not, he's not his quality of plays and decreasing as he increases his speed is amazing to me. It's something that's going to translate really well. And that's what makes him such a, such a projectable player, in my opinion. And as a November 05 birthday, sure, he's one of the older players in this class, but there's still a lot to love here in terms of the quality of play that he brings. And um, for an undersized player, you need to have that kind of skating ability. Um, 
But we'll also get into the details, the more intricate stuff in Mises Game in our second segment here, where we break down the toolkit, so how the tools interact, the habits in Luke Mises Game, the decision-making, and all that good stuff. That's all coming up after these messages from our sponsors over at Sleeper. We are now past the halfway point of the NHL season as the regular season is wrapping up and the trade deadline is in the rearview mirror, but there's still time for you to get in on the action with Sleeper. Sleeper is our number one choice here at the Locked On NHL Podcast Network for all of your daily fantasy hockey needs. That's because with Sleeper, you can win 100 times your money in daily fantasy hockey contests. All you have to do to win that is to correctly predict the outcome of eight specific player stats. And you can get really creative with that if you want to, whether you want to take some swings on the stars of the league like Nikita Kucherov and Nathan McKinnon, who is up to a 35 game uh, point streak at home for the Colorado Avalanche. Or maybe you can stick a bit more in line with the, with the theme of this particular podcast and take the swings on the NHL's young guns. I mean, Connor Bedard ain't half bad at hockey. Uh, use promo code Locked On NHL and you'll get up to a one hundred dollar match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. That's code Locked On NHL. See Sleeper's terms of use for details and locational availability. Alrighty, so moving on to what I call the mental segment of a player's game here in our prospect spotlight on Luke Misa. Uh, we'll start off with the toolkit because I think we alluded to it a little bit earlier on, but the way that his skating and hands and passing ability all combine, uh, the fact that he's able to make these plays at a top speed, I think that's a given at this point, given how much we've talked about it. That's a big part of his toolkit, uh, the way his tools interact. Uh, outside of that, though, I really like the way he uses his skating defensively. Um, he's a pretty solid defensive player. Uh, you know, in, in terms of his ability to get back in zone, to be able to make plays uh, on the back check, um, I really like that. And when we did the TJ Ginla um, as prospect spotlight, we talked about how Iginla's high motor actually takes him out of defensive plays. I don't think that's the case with Luke Miso. He's really good at pacing himself on the back check to be able to lift the stick at the exact right moment to put a stick in the right lanes. He's not over skating his lanes. He's staying within his parameters, figuring out what the next play is. And he has that ability to take a step back effort-wise in order to take a step forward defensively, right? Yeah, for sure. Like, I think my views have perhaps varied a little bit on that front in terms of especially like the in-zone defensive uh, output, especially while defending the cycle. Uh, I can see him get a little bit pigeonholed on just puck watching rather than necessarily scanning for all the threats on the ice. But yeah. I think like... The, the most of the defensive upside with Misa comes on the back check. He's a really capable pickpocket, and he uses his skating ability so effectively to not only catch up the puck carrier, but to stick in their blind spot, get underneath the stick, and just immediately rip the puck out of, out of their grasp and uh, and catapult play back the other direction. He's such a capable yeah. counterattacker. As soon as he pickpockets a player, he's off to the races once again. So I definitely think there's, there's some upside there defensively, but I, I haven't seen the most refined overall defensive toolkit so far this season there yeah for sure i think it really varies depends on what situation he's in but when when the plays in when the plays in front of him on the back check is really good um yeah. when the plays in front of him and he's facing towards the opposing net i think there's a bit of variability there for sure uh what i'd say though is um the lack of size certainly affects him in terms of the way he plays the game, uh, but I really like the way that he approaches board battles still for a shorter guy. Uh, I've often seen him kind of lower a center of gravity, get under opponent's sticks, you know, uh, along the boards. He's mainly looking to, um, instead of instead of trying to outmuscle a player, he looks to incapacitate him by um, kind of going through his hands on the body check. So if a player is, for example, if a defenseman is along the boards and trying to kind of dig the puck out, he'll kind of hit through the arms of the player rather than go for the chest, uh, which allows him to be able to free up his hands while lo while locking the defenseman's hands in place. Um, that's one thing I've really identified as kind of a, a bona fide strength of his in terms of his board game. But outside of that, um, he gets pinned to the boards a lot. When he's, when he's trying to look for space in the middle, he's pretty good at it, but he's pretty easy to pin along the boards. He's pretty easy to take out of place physically. It's quite easy when you catch up to him, when you have the skating ability that he has. If Even if you're slightly less good of a skater, it's really easy to take Luke Misa out of plays if you're able to keep up with him. The question is keeping up with him, right? 
For sure. Like, I think one more question I'd have along those lines, because it's really varied in, in my viewing so far this season, is how his, like, habits on the puck actually support him in, uh, like, adapting to his lack of size and physicality, which, as you mentioned, is already quite apparent even at the OHL level. Yeah, exactly. I think that um, on the puck, I would say that, you know, when he's cutting to the middle, like I said, when, when he is doing that, it's pretty good. His ability to cut uh, quick corners off the boards, uh, to be able to spin off of pressure and use his edge work rather than his, you know, his shoulders or his arms in order to protect pucks. It's pretty good. But I would say that there's still a there's still room for growth in terms of his ability to uh, shield a puck. You know, shorter players have have been better at, you know, we've seen shorter players be better than this at shielding a puck with their arms, using their entire body to um, get sticks out of the way and and kind of access the middle, right? I think that's one element that could... Logan Stankoven is a perfect example. Brendan Gallagher is another one. You don't have to be big to be a good puck protector. Um, But I I wouldn't say Luke Meese is a good puck protector by any means, but I would say that when it comes to deciding between a pass shot and a handle really really good i think the decision making is really good on that end it's just for me there's there's questions outside of that and it mostly has to do with everything that has to do with prolonging offensive zone sequences because when it comes to putting finishing touches on plays the decision making is on point but when it comes to um shielding a puck in order to play a low to high in order to extend offensive zone possession i think things tend to falter a little bit with misa um outside of that do you have any quarrels with his decision making from the viewers you've seen or nothing much I've liked it a, a lot. I think that, like what you mentioned, like that 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 real like ability to put those finishing touches and make the right decisions in those moments, yeah. even when he's under pressure and he has very little time to make that choice, he consistently makes like one of the best plays available to him. And yeah. that's something that I always look for, especially in undersized players who struggle perhaps to extend their time on puck, uh, that, that they're able to do as much as they can with the time that, that they have on the puck. And as you mentioned, there's definitely work to be done for Misa to be able to extend offensive zone sequences, whether it be for the his team as a whole or even just for his, himself and his own puck touches. But uh, that, that, that ability to identify high danger plays very quickly and immediately go for it rather than hesitating that's definitely an area of strength in this game and it's one of the reasons that he's been Mississauga's primary play driver offensively this season yeah for sure I mean the the points speak for themselves the production has been off the charts and yeah I mean you can you can tell through his point totals just by looking you know if you want to do some some score sheet scouting I mean 26 goals 55 assists that gives you a good idea what kind of play Sally goes for but uh, he's still able to create plays at a decent rate. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not too worried with uh, that element of uh, Mises' game. Outside of that, in terms of the the, the toolkit, I think that the, um, the, the, the the skating and the ability to get off the boards um, is, is something that I've really liked in my viewings. Again, not really in terms of his prop protection mechanics, not really in terms of his usage of his shoulders and his body itself, but um, he's got really, really good edges, which helps him kind of you know, separate from opponents really, really well. I think the off puck movement in the offensive zone is another thing we haven't really talked about that I think is really worth talking about. For sure. His ability to choose the right routes in order to, to find these little pockets of space from which to take shots, from which to make passes, um, is really evident, especially on the power play, because he doesn't stay on the half wall. He's often kind of making rotations with players, going behind the net, um, kind of rotating with his defenseman. Another thing I really like about his off puck movement is how often he's cycling up towards a blue line in order to offer kind of a, a drop pass option to his defenseman if his defenseman wants to activate. I just don't think there are enough defensemen in Mississauga that like to activate. Um, you know, if you have the likes of Jakob Fiebiger and uh, Parker Von Richter and those kind of guys, yeah. but none of them are really true offensive activators. And Misa, I think, will be really good in a system that favors that. Um, but we'll get into which team will be the best fit in our next segment here. Uh, we'll talk also about the projection with Luke Misha, how he projects at the NHL level, what his upside is, what his floor is. Um, and like I said, the best team fit. We'll get into that right after these messages from our sponsors at the FanDuel. The sports calendar is loaded and FanDuel's making it even more exciting to get in on the action. Because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 that you can bet on uh, that you can use to bet on any tourney, whether it be the MLB, the NBA, the NHL, and so much more. I know I personally am always a very big fan of single game parlays as they make the action all the more exciting, especially when you're 
attending an event live. You can bet a couple separate bets for the same game and uh, cross your fingers and hope they work out. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and make your first bet a big win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. All righty, so closing things off with our final segment, we'll be talking about the projection with Luke Misa, how he projects at the NHL level, what kind of style of player you can expect from him, what the upside is going to be, uh, what the floor is, and uh, what team is going to be the best fit for him. So we'll start off with the projection. Uh, I think that, like you mentioned at the start of the video, I could see him be more of a winger than a, than a center um, at the NHL level. Although I don't think center's out of the question. I just think some specific things need to kind of fall in place for that to work out for him. Um, I think the end zone defending needs to come some way. He's not necessarily the best face-off taker. Um, you know, the, the, the technique on face-offs isn't ideal, uh, even though he's been kind of the primary center, primary face-off taker for Mississauga. Um, it's not always been on point in terms of his ability to win them uh, in, a, in a kind of projectable, effective way, especially as an undersized guy. But as a winger, I think this, the speed that he can bring to the game uh, is ridiculous. And to answer the question of the video, is he the paciest prospect of this uh, of this draft? I think he is. Um, yeah. I don't think there's many, many forwards for sure that can keep up with him. Defensemen, maybe Sam Dickinson, maybe Artyom Levshinov, but even that's a reach. Um his skating ability is ridiculous. And again, just the the agility, the pace that he brings uh, would be really useful on breakouts, really useful on the wing um, to kind of stretch the ice offensively and uh, keep defensemen on their heels rather than on their toes um, in transition. Uh, so that's one thing for him. Uh, but what do you see as the upside, the true everything goes right upside with Luke Nisa? Uh, yeah, like... For, for me this season, I've been going back and forth a little bit of whether I think he can just be a super, super pacey, like fun playmaking third line winger, or if I see some really intriguing like second line upside with him, I think that's kind of where I've been going back and forth recently. And I've been seeing a lot of viewings that have been supporting either of those, those options. And there's a big difference yeah. in terms of ranking a prospect uh, between those two upsides. But at his best, Luke Misa reminds me a lot about, of a player like Alex Newhook, for instance. He's really able to leverage his skating ability to create advantages both defensively and offensively. He's very intelligent with how he's able to leverage his his plus level tools in unison at high speeds. And uh, he is also quite slot driven with his playmaking ability. He's not like... While he's physically pushed the perimeter at times, he will constantly be looking for those seam passes and get try to get the puck to the high danger areas. So while he's still working on his physicality to get his physical body towards the slot a bit more often on puck, which he does off puck very well, obviously, uh, the playmaking is so slot centered that I think it is fairly projectable. But uh, what, what would you think of like an Alex Newhook comp? Because like for me, that would be like the extreme end of the upside yeah i think that's a that's an apt comparison in terms of what they bring to the game i think that i think that misa is a bit more composed and intelligent defensively than new hook for sure um but definitely less skilled as well you know new, new hook's got a fantastic shot and we've seen it so far this year with montreal it's um it's a great release that he can get it can shoot in motion i haven't seen that yet from misa um but I think that Misa has a bit more defensive ability to his game, which actually makes him a bit more easy to project for me as a middle six forward. Um, I could very well see him be kind of the the tertiary piece on the second line or the primary piece on the third line as a player who exactly. consistently supports play, consistently connects play, um, and offers a, a decent amount of defensive value. For me, you know, even though the defensive game in zone isn't there yet, I think that he's smart enough to make it work. Uh, and he's got enough speed going both ways in order to just dominate the transition game. So for me, it's just that area of his game he's got down pat. He's got the playmaking game. It's just about kind of tweaking the defensive tools a tiny bit, make him a bit more projectable in terms of where he stands, where he positions himself in the defensive zone. Um, but these are things that usually come with time. I'm not too worried about the defensive game scaling up. He's not awful defensively. He's not a player who fundamentally lacks an understanding of the game that manifests itself in the defensive zone. It's just he has... He has fundamental, great fundamental understanding of the game. It just hasn't manifested itself in the defensive zone yet. That's a big distinction for me. Um, he's a smart player who hasn't figured it out defensively versus a player like Cole Eiserman who makes wrong decisions in all three zones and it's just more obvious in the defensive zone, right? Like there's a there's a difference in, in assessment regarding how far he can go defensively um, versus Cole Eiserman, for example. Um, but in terms of the best team fit, I think there's a lot of options here. 
I would really like to see Montreal take a swing on him. And I know they have a bunch of undersized forwards and, uh, you know, they've got a bunch of these kind of middle six to bottom six upside guys and yada, yada. yada. I just, I, I like the fit. I think he works really well with the system that they have going on there. Martin, Martin said is putting in a system that really incorporates defensive zone act, uh, defensive, sorry, defensemen activating in the, def- in the offensive zone. Um, and I think that Luke Misa, like we mentioned at some point in this video, really, really needs a system that favors that activation because right now he's he's cycling up to the blue line and then has nowhere to go um, because his defensemen aren't aren't uh, you know switching with him and kind of making those plays. Um, what other teams do you see as kind of options for Luke Misa? I think the Minnesota Wild would be very interested in a player like oh, Luke sure. Misa. They sure. quite routinely uh, swing on players who fall in the draft relative to like upside and skill. Like we saw it with Riley Height last season, who should not have been available at the end of the second round, and uh, Minnesota yep. was like sprinting to the podium to to, to call his name. Uh, and I think that I mean, Luke Misa in Bob McKenzie's last ranking, I believe, was ranked like 69th or 70th overall. Uh, and this is a player that, at least in our estimation, has the upside comparable to a play that that, that, that should get selected in that 20 to 30 range, perhaps. Right. And yeah. I think Minnesota would be all over that profile, especially after uh, taking a questionable swing on Charlie Stramel in the first round last year. I think they might be rather enticed of uh continuing to collect uh potential high like like high upside pokemon balls which uh misa would be a pretty good one to add to the, to the yeah cupboard. absolutely uh he, he'd be a fantastic figure in minnesota i think that also you know um a team like anaheim could use that kind of player in the middle to bottom six um i i think that you know they've got their their stars locked in i think they don't need to worry about kind of top six potential prospects for the next you know two, three drafts. Um, so outside of the first round, you know, if they're picking 35th to 40th in the second round, Luke Mies is almost definitely going to be available. These undersized, fast, skilled players, usually they don't necessarily get picked really, really high. So I wouldn't be shocked yeah. at all to see him available in the 40 range. And if Anaheim wants to pick him up, I think he's a great option for them to fill out their bottom six uh, with players who can support transitions really well, potentially play on the second power play for them. Um, you know, kind of give them good minutes in those situations. I think the Luke Misa fits that mold great. Um, outside I have, of that, I have one last I mean, team. Yeah, the Seattle Kraken, I think, would be a really interesting fit. Oh, uh, I've, absolutely. I've been struggling to really pin down their, their their draft philosophy because they've been a little bit all over the place in terms of like profiles that, that they select on draft yeah. day. But they have had a tendency on just taking swings on raw skilled players with upside that are available mm-hmm. later than those players typically are like last year they were focusing a little bit more on the defensemen that were falling like lucas dragasevic and Caden price who were both very raw and uh very much like, quite theoretical in terms of nhl projection and i think yeah. luke misa is a lot more concrete in that facet while still having some pretty intriguing upside and we have seen seattle really liking to, to to take swings on pacey skilled even undersized forwards with guys like jagger Furcus, for instance so i think he'd be a really nice fit uh with the kraken and uh i mean hey who wouldn't want to uh, play in that climate pledge arena it's a gorgeous building <laughs> absolutely it's beautiful uh but that wraps things up for today's show thank you very much for tuning in if you're watching on youtube make sure to like and subscribe leave us a comment letting us know what you thought of the episode what you, th- what you think of luke misa if we mentioned your team as a potential favorite to pick him let us know why you would like him or why you would not like him uh and if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform please make sure to leave us a rate and review it helps the channel out a lot and make sure to make us your first listen of the day for your second listen of the day make sure to check out locked on sports today they got all your news and updates about what's going on around sports and make sure to tune in for our next show is we can continue our prospect coverage from the month of April. This has been Hattie Kalakesh, uh, Director of North American Scouting for Dauber Prospects, with Sebastian High, Director of European Scouting for Dauber Prospects and Head Scout, and we'll see you next time.